So thank you for being here today, everyone. We're super excited to have people in person um, and be out on the farm. Because really, I think the best way to understand a lot of this stuff is to, to see in real life how it's done. Um, but just to preface, I guess, uh, you may be wondering or noticing that we're under an overpass right now. Um, and <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can pan up to the overpass. Uh, so this is Farm 18. Farm 18 is chronologically the first Grow Ohio Valley site that was ever established. Um, it's the site that uh, Danny Swan, who was former executive director, founder of Grow V, started uh, gardening with a group of kids from the Lachlan Chapel just down the street. So this space was, uh, at that time, totally unused. It's Department of Highways land, uh, which we maintain on a beautification permit. Um, so Danny started bringing those kids down there. It's got to be like 12 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and Tapa was also around at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so since then, since they started planting those very first beds, uh, we've worked really hard to kind of build up the soil here. Um, this space used to be uh, a housing development. So uh, this land is like not the most supportive to, uh, to healthy plant growth, right? Like um, if you tried to run a tiller through this ground, which you tried to do that at one point, you would run into like a lot of debris. It's a bunch of foundations. Uh, with like fill in them. Uh, so this site is maintained with no-till gardening practices uh, and these beds have been built up over a decade with lots and lots of organic material, lots of mulch, lots of compost, um, and is now one of our most reliable and productive sites. Um, so it takes time and care but uh, really like one of the things that I think Grow High Valley best showcases is that um, you can you can turn a space into something productive. You just have to be really diligent about taking care of it. Another term for what happened here um, in terms of making it productive is called lasagna gardening, which is basically a way of layering organic material, even things uh, like cardboard, kind of whatever you can get your hands on. and. Uh, Gradually, with a lot of patience and determination, it turns into soil. So last year, for example, this this small space here produced fifteen thousand dollars worth of vegetables, which was distributed through the uh, community-supported agriculture as well as the public market on Fourteenth and Main. Yeah, I think a few of these. Well, I don't know, but I, I know Lori is a CSA subscriber, so uh, Lori is. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, we grow food here. We also have some kids coming here still. Uh, we still work with the chapel down the street. That purpose hasn't changed. Um, but it's it's a great teaching space. So we're gonna we're gonna do a, a little walkthrough today to cover a couple of topics. Um, the <laughs> the itinerary is all the way over there, but I can run through the the topics we're gonna cover tonight. So uh, this workshop is garden maintenance. It's one of the Grow Appalachia workshops that we uh, have to give you guys, that we want to give you guys, of course. Um, and the topics that we're going to cover tonight, uh, as you know, basic and maybe obvious as it would seem, uh, we're going to talk about observation, observing things in your garden. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about watering, best practices for that. We'll talk about weeding and uh, mulch. And then we'll do a, just a little, uh, we'll kind of go around and see what you all are experiencing and if you have questions. Uh, feel free to stop and ask questions at any point. We can do Q&A and you guys on Zoom, uh, Caroline's monitoring the chat so you can ask uh, questions on Zoom and we can, um, we can hopefully get those answered. Um, but I think, does everybody have a handout? Oh, we didn't share the handout with the online people, but Caroline's doing that right now. That's perfect. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is 
talk about observation and I don't know I think this is uh, like I said it may seem obvious but it is one of the most important things you can do to ensure that your garden is productive if you're not out looking at that space every single day for at least five to ten minutes you're gonna miss a lot of stuff that um, would if if you had caught it would have led you to maybe some solutions um, so the main point of this observation is that you got to do it <laughs> five to ten minutes every day even more if you can just spend time out in your garden and look around um, there's a few things you can look for uh, if if you're um, kind of maybe at a loss of what you should be looking for um, typically like some easy things that you can try to look for are uh, wildlife right so animals and insects just like what is there even uh, good stuff bad stuff what is there what are they doing what plants are they on um, look at your wildlife um, you can look at your soil so just take a look uh, visually at your soil uh, what does the moisture look like um, touch your soil see uh, how it feels uh, does it feel like it needs water? Is it super dry? Is it really, really wet? That's really important to keeping your plants happy. Um, and then look at your plants, right? <laughs> That's one of the most important things. Your plants can tell you a lot based on uh, what they're doing. So things, uh, again, good and bad things or uh, just whatever is there is what you want to look for. So things like wilt, like yellowing, um, rot or disease, right? Um, and then what do you see? Pests. You can make a note if they're healthy even. You can look for your little fruits forming. Uh, you can look for things going to seed, right? Or bolting. Uh, sometimes you don't want things to go to seed. Uh, you can look for vines. Just anything that's there is what you want to observe. And I would even recommend uh, keeping a garden journal if you don't already. Just designate a little space and in your five to 10 minute observation, uh, just jot down something that you see. Cause that's how you learn from it really is if you can refer back to it. You know, like on this date last year, I had flea beetles on my eggplant or my cabbage. Um, and you can prepare for that going into the next year. Yeah. I have some, uh, I don't know if you call it burn, but I've uh, watered my seedlings, and I was a little sloppy, so mm. I don't know the leaves, mm -hmm. and it was in the direct side. Does that mean those leaves will be brown? So, I mean, you can feel free to chime in too, but the area that was burned may not necessarily recover, but uh, as long as there is other green areas on your plant, um, that should be okay. They should recover. What, what kind of plants were they that got? Tomatoes, tomato plants. Right. I mean, tomatoes are so vigorous in their growth that it, it does, if those leaves that got burnt from just so everyone knows, when, it, when she says burnt, it means that the sun, the intensity of the sun on a bead of water magnifies it like a magnifying glass, and then you burn mm -hmm. like that. So if it's not too serious, you can just kind of pick around. The reason, the reason for that is that the plant's nature is it wants to heal that and thus waste some energy mm -hmm. doing it. So because tomatoes are so vigorous, you can even pick those off and at the node where that leaf meets the stem, it'll it'll grow another it'll grow another leaf. So don't yeah. don't feel shy to yeah. give a haircut to your plants. Yeah, yeah especially with tomatoes, yeah, they'll tomatoes be totally are fine. Amazing. Um, Observation is so important because just the act of going out and looking at and so to speak communing with your plants, um, they are living entities just like we are. And they, they actually 
pick up on the energy of the person caring for them. And it, there's actually been studies like that, that. Plants are sensitive to certain types of music, heavy rock compared to Bach and uh, <laughs> more mellow, racial <laughs> melodies. Bach is objectively so, better So the than fact that you rock. go out and you look every day like that teaches you Sometimes gardening and farming, you, uh, there are lessons you learn in gardening and farming that are su very subtle, and they're there by observ because of observation. They're there, and they don't really you don't get the realization until later on. And you start kind of putting it putting it together. Yeah, yeah. Over time, that will accumulate. Mm -hmm. So. We wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to practice a little bit. Uh, so now uh, we want to take five minutes and uh, just walk around. You can give yourself a little self-guided tour and uh, on your sheet or just in your mind, maybe pick out like three observations about any of the plants that you see here. Uh, Nothing is an incorrect observation. Just like look for something that uh, maybe you wouldn't have looked for before. Uh, so we'll take five minutes and do that. And if you're at home, you can feel free to do that in your own garden uh, and come back with some observations. Did anybody see, observe anything interesting that they care to share? Only if you want to. Like some of the weeds were very similar to what I'm having. Like the, like, mushrooms even more, but like, they're prolific and they have like a little spikes. Thistle. Yeah. yeah. We think it's milk thistle? We think it's milk thistle. Milk thistle. Yeah. We'll, we'll see that down at the next stop. Uh, yeah, a lot of weeds popping up. I noticed that there was some yarrow growing down there. That's kind of nice. You can pass that around. Anything, uh, how about, you can look at our categories. Anything related to wildlife that you guys saw? It looked like um, some of the plants look like they've been chewed off the top. Yeah. Even the onions had some things. Down here? They sort of look like marigolds, but they're not. Cosmos. Oh, cosmos. Yeah, cosmos. They got really, really chomped. There's some loose rabbits around. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, it's like on our list to uh, rabbit proof the fence. Um, yeah, that's pretty rough on those Cosmos. We were sad about that. Um, yeah, can you try to like repeat what? Oh yeah, good call, good call. Lori just mentioned that time that there was a row of plants that had been really, really uh, eaten by something. And we know that it's rabbits and their cosmos. Um, did anybody look at soil? Is that uh, straw or hay that you guys have? That is hay. Uh, that's what we have most in most abundance, uh, Donnie asked, is what we have on our beds, straw or hay. Um, and we use hay mulch here, uh, and there's, you know, pros and cons to using hay mulch. It can have a lot of seed in it, or uh, we're going to, like, there's actually a whole section on mulch that we can maybe... Do you, do you know the difference between hay and straw? Does one have seeds, like, more than the other? Right, but straw is the shaft of a very desirable plant like wheat or rye or barley or something without the head. The head has been harvested. I swear the and it's is. just the shaft before it goes into the ground. And the, the modern combines, highly mechanized, high-tech combines now just take the, the head off, but the straw is valuable because it has no weed seed in it. By comparison, hay is uh, uh, has multiple types of weeds in it. Ideally, it is more of a particular type of 
grass. And we'll, when we take our little walk and like that, I'll, I'll go into more detail on that. Yeah, but we do use hay. It's, it's what we have. Um, okay, great. Anybody else before we move on? Anything burning? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for doing that. It's really important that you observe your garden uh, and spend time in the garden. Uh, as Tapa said, that's, there's lots of subtle things that you can pick up on when you spend the time. Um, so uh, let's see, the next thing, we're going to move on to uh, the next couple of topics are going to be at different spots in the farm. So we'll move on to watering next. Uh, so we'll get up and we're going to go over to just a little bit that ways to the, to the pink flag over there and talk about watering. Watering, very important. I should be, we should be near the Zoom people so that they can see us. Sorry, Zoom people. Hopefully we're in the frame. Uh, the things, like the points to hit on watering really, um, that we wanted to talk about are uh, when, how much, and uh, like how slash where to water. Um, and this is like kind of one of the tips that I hear uh, about gardening a lot. Um, but when you're watering, um, it's pretty important to consider the time of day as Lori has talked about her situation, uh, watering at a time of day where there's like a lot of direct sun um, can lead to damage on the leaves. Uh, so whenever possible, you want to do your watering early in the morning. Um, and if you have to, you can also do it in the evening as well. Um, but if you can, you really want to try to avoid watering in the heat of the day. Um, because that could lead to damage on your leaves. There, there are exceptions to that. Like if you're in a, if you went away and your plants are drying up, shriveling, or the ground is cracking like that, then getting water and cooling the soil temperature down mm -hmm. is really important. Like especially if you're trying to grow things that are cool loving, like lettuce, mm -hmm. for example. What causes lettuce to bolt go to seed quickly or spinach is another example of a cool loving plant, cool weather loving plant. So in that case, if you have no option, you can water, even if you do it on top like this, not at the base, although it's more ideal to do it at the base of the plant. Because what you're doing is cooling the soil temperature down. And if the soil temperature gets up beyond its, uh, that cool range, it sends a genetic signal to those plants and they bolt. And that's kind of the pattern that you see here in, in uh, this part of the world is that people get a late garden in and they unfortunately plant things that are cool loving. And about this time, third week in May, first week in June, it all bolts. <laughs> Can you define bolt? Does that ever, everyone know what bolt Bolting means? Bolting means going to seed. It means the, a genetic trigger, again, sometimes because of the heat of the soil, not just the, the air temperature, but the heat of the soil is the critical factor. And so therefore, it, it genetically sends a signal that it's time to have a family and put up seeds. So it sends up a stalk and begins forming seeds. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the other part of when would be like how often, <coughs> like um, how much do you need to water your plants? Um, and in the summer, in like the heat of the summer, it can be just about every day if there's not rain. Um, I don't know, do you have any recommendations on how often you would water your plants? Yeah, it's, if you have the, the facility to water once or twice a week deeply, that's much better than shallow watering. The reason is, when you shallow water, the root systems of those plants especially annuals that, are, that you have to replant every year, have no incentive to go deep. 
and very often deep in the soil is where your um, micronutrients are. Cobalt, copper, manganese, all these things that uh, really enforce the health and strength of your plants and flavor as well. So if you can do it, if you have the luxury of being uh, able to water when you want to water, not just sort of forced to because of whatever work or family or whatever, deep watering is much better because the roots tend to go down to get it. And shallow watering means they just stay on the surface. I farmed for a few years in Mississippi where it's very hot and very sandy. It's old ocean bottom, basically. And I couldn't figure out why plants were yellowing, even though I'd done the fertility work and they look, in the beginning they look great. And that's a county extension agent there explained that to me. So you're, you're just shallow watering and they, they're not getting nutrition. So deep is better if you can do it. Can you give us an example of how long you would yep. water fish a deep water? Okay. All right, so let's use this example of these are uh, a particular type of mulch, which even though it's black, we're going to talk about this in a minute or two, is um, believe it or not, even though it's black, it actually retains water. So deep watering would be... You guys can get close if you want. I don't to stay away. Let it puddle, you see in the puddle go down, go to the next plant. And then come back. Right. And watch, watch where the water goes. In other words, there's no point in watering it if it's just, <laughs> it's just running off. So if you have the time, and most of us I think have rather small gardens, we're not doing acres, half acres or anything like that. That's the best way. Like that. That's the best way to water. And uh, when you come back the next day, put your finger in and just see kind of what, what did I do here, actually? What did I get down in there? Is it retaining the water? And this, of course, goes to point out that when you're planting these plants, always create a little bowl around them. In other words, put the plant in, be it a transplant or if it's coming up by direct seeding, make sure that there's a little swale there, sometimes in a circle shape or if it's in a direct line, to hold the water. Otherwise, it just tends to run away. Okay, cool. Um, and then I think you kind of demonstrated this when you were doing that deep water, but uh, where you're going to water is at the base of that plant rather than on the leaves. This is important also because if you're really watching what happens with insects, each one of these vegetables that you're planting, for example, tomatoes has a particular insect that will attack it. The cabbage family, brassicas family, has particular, these little white moths that you see fluttering around, attack. So the application of organic uh, insecticides to deal with that, to save your garden. Which we will talk about soon, but not today. Right, is, depends upon the timing of putting them on and re-putting them on in case it rains or if you accidentally water not at the base. So you just, you just washed away basically if you're, if you're not careful your protection, so that's important. Always water at the base if possible. Water at the base. Should people be worried about overwatering? Yeah, because if, uh, if you overwater, what happens is you encourage a kind of bacterial growth that may not be healthy for your plants. So you want, you don't want to overdo it. Just like in your own body, you don't want to, you want to drink water and stay hydrated, but you don't want to be waterlogged. So the same thing is true of plant root systems. So you can't overwater. Most of it's just common sense. You just kind of see what, how, as, that's why observation again is so important. You see kind of how your plants are relating to the way that you're watering. And therefore you may increase or you may decrease a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Any questions related to watering from anyone? Seedlings get like fuzzy. You know what I mean? 
They're getting fuzzy, some? Like a couple of them, like, get like a. They get fuzzy. Like a hair. Yeah, and I read online you can put like cinnamon on them, or like to prevent yeah. that, and it worked for the rest of them, or maybe it was just like a coincidence, but. Um, I don't. But that's like a problem I get with a lot of my seedlings, like right when I start them, that. And then I feel like they're too dry if I don't. Oh, so are they, you think they're getting moldy? It's almost moldy, but it's not, moldy. Like, it's not bad, it's just fuzzy. Like, it's, on, it's on the surface yeah. of your seedlings? Yeah. Is yeah. there a plant or just the soil that you seed it into? It's just the soil. Just the soil, so it's like fuzzy on the surface of the soil. Yeah. I feel like that might be mold. That's what I was thinking, but then like sometimes it like will go away. Yeah. And then I'm like, well now is the soil like yeah. and... No, it's not no. contaminated, but you may be overwatering. Yeah. You may be adding too much water. Can I let it go? And then it, yeah. Like, for example, if you guys are planting transplants, you're direct seeding into a cell pack, mm -hmm. tomatoes or whatever it may be, that little bit of soil that makes up the root ball in a cell pack, <laughs> if you overwater, whatever little bit of nutrition is in there, you just flushed it out. You've leached it out. And then the plant is like, now what? <laughs> yeah. It's trying, you know, it's trying to be, it's, it needs nutrition. So you have to be, your watering ideally is from the bottom up, capillary motion. If you can set your mm -hmm. cell packs in a little bit of water and let them pick up what they need, that's ideal. If you can't do that, be a little conservative in your watering. Yeah. Don't just automatically water, oh, it's better water, and you just wash all the nutrition out of it. Yeah, so like the deep watering applies once it's into the ground, I guess I'm going to say. Right. Um, and I would also just uh, say to pay attention to the drainage, I guess. So like make sure it's not sitting in water for too long. Like the capillary motion, let it draw up from the bottom, but don't let it just keep sitting in standing water once it's had enough. Generally speaking, if you see a puddle, you've planted, you've created a little bowl around it so it holds water, you see it puddle and it goes in nicely, you've moved on, and then you come back and give it another little bit of water, that's generally enough. You don't have to get um, hit it three or four times like that, not necessary. Yeah. So maybe try watering from the bottom and see if that changes yeah, anything. Like, I have like one of those seedling like, trays. Everything else is fine. It's just mm -hmm. like this one row. Hmm. Of lip. It's like um, rainbow chart. Interesting. It's just send us a picture. I'm really curious. Okay. We can. I take like a little office fan, like your like, desk, and like twice a week, like for an hour or two. Yeah. Illustrate the thing, and also get that top part of the soil kind of dry. Yeah. Yeah. Donnie just said he uses an office fan to dry off the top of his soil. So that could also be helpful. Keep air movement is really good. That's really good. Okay. Anything else on watering? You want to move on? No. Uh, well, of course, the, as you know, rainwater is a hundred times better than city water. You'll really see a difference in your plants if you could do that experiment and do five feet of, of just allowing the rain to come or catch rainwater and apply that. And that's because when it rains, it pulls 82% of the atmosphere that we're breathing right now, it's nitrogen. So rain and snow is called poor man's nitrogen. <laughs> And city water, by, by comparison, is coming up from a well, God knows where, and has chlorine added to it. So if you're forced to water through a garden hose in your garden, the ideal thing is to put it in something, let it sit 24 hours, and the chlorine goes out. It's chlor chlorine-free just by letting it sit. Now, you may not have that luxury to do that. But if you have a barrel like that and you just fill it with city water, uh, let it sit a day at least, and then then water with that. It's much healthier than just direct Department of, of Water Works water. Yeah. <laughs> but if that's what you have and that's what you're gonna use, that's okay. I'll say. It's okay. All right. Yep. Let's. Uh, okay, we'll move on to weeding. They take nutrition out of the soil, and they also take water out of the soil. So if you don't, it, we don't want that competition. However, it's also true that the weeds have root systems and certain plants that are like pioneers. If you're in a, a situation where you're living in a place that the soil was completely disturbed when they built the house, 
It's compacted. That's what this whole thing was like. It was a disaster zone. And <coughs> some weeds, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for example, dandelion or burdock, which we'll show an example of in a minute here, or thistle has a <coughs> taproot that acts as a, a, it penetrates the soil and breaks the soil up down deep so that your vegetable plants can go a little deeper. However, if, it, if they're right close to your plants, that's not desirable. So for example, this is a, did you guys all get one of these? No. Okay, we've got some. I don't get one of those. <laughs> we picked this oh, kind. Oh, you didn't pick up tools, did you? No. We picked this kind of a, a cultivating tool because of its precision. Uh, the regular hoe will also work, but most people don't know how to work a hoe. And they think just by sort of slicing with the, the broad face of the hoe that they're going to do weeding. And they're actually meant to be used on an angle. So you get just the corner. So this, uh, this solves that. We call it a, just an arrowhead hoe. So let's say you've got, let's, let's go down here. Let's say you've got a row of lettuce here and a another row of lettuce here interplanted with radish and another row of lettuce here and you'll notice that within days of planting little weeds are coming up and therefore there's a saying in the organic vegetable world if you can see them it's too late <laughs> which means that you want to preventively deal with that so this is a great tool for that because you can get in between very, very uh, precisely and just disturb that soil. There are other tools that do this also, but not. I personally prefer these. So you're just disturbing, disturbing, disturbing. Once those plants get up, they're up say four or five inches like this. Then you can also use this type of cultivator to pull what you disturbed up alongside and that's called uh, dust mulching in other words using the dirt to mulch we'll talk more about mulching in a minute so like that so very handy especially if you have a I've, I've worked with crews of people teaching them organic small-scale organic farming and I would have 10 of these and in the beginning I'd say okay we're gonna we're gonna weed this whole area here and they're looking at me like you're completely out of your mind but when you get when you get everybody doing learning to use the tool properly, you're not dragging the soil, creating ditches. You're just undercutting with it, like this. And uh, ten people with this can do damage. They they can actually weed a whole bed of say uh, green beans or something very quickly. Like that. So it's a wonderful tool. Um, Does anybody want to try? What? Demonstrate your technique. I mine yesterday. It works really well. Okay, you tried this? Yes, okay, yes. great. It works beautifully. You like? Okay. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, another thing to consider is that in a bed like this, besides what's coming up with your vegetables is the edges. This is really important because there are certain types of grasses that, that uh, crawl underground with what are called rhizomes. There's the mother plant and the sisters of that mother, the offspring of that mother, are the rhizomes that go like this. And once you get that established in a bed, you're in trouble. Because almost no matter how much mulch you put on it, you can't, almost can't stop it. So therefore, keeping the edges clean, I, I do like a six inch, I call no man's land, where I don't let that happen. It takes a little extra work, but it's well worth it. Because if you ignore that issue, then you end up with invasion from subterranean invasion <laughs> coming out. Where did that come from? I thought I just weeded. Well, it came from rhizomes crawling underground like that. So, for example, in an area like this, on this edge here, let me get on the ground here. Top, you want the shovel? Oh, no, you don't. Uh, that's okay if you don't. No, that's right. Well, yeah. I, I would use, my favorite weeding tool is a trenching shovel. Do you know what a trenching shovel is? 
instead of it being like this shape, it's very narrow and about this long with a, little, with a handle about this high. I bet I can find Those are for digging trenches, but they're also great weeding tools because of the, again, the precision. This is, this is more of a transfer shovel. You're moving quantities of something. But same principle is there, and that is that I do it, I do it like an act of yoga. I sit down, stretch out, so I'm not bending and wasting my energy bending up and down. Then using a trenching shovel, so then using the, the shovel itself so that I don't throw, I'm not throwing my topsoil all the way. I'm just getting rid of the root system. So there's two kinds of weeding, and I know this based upon dealing with a lot of apprentices, and that is cosmetic weeding, weeding which only lasts for about a week, <laughs> and real weeding, which means actually get it out by the root. So this system of just working along the edge is very effective for protecting the valuable space where your bed is. And again, just knock the dirt off. Don't throw your tops all the way. What do you do with this? Mulch. Yeah, you can use this. Once that root system is up and out, it's not going to live anymore unless you throw dirt on it and it rains. So if you have a squash plant here, for example, you can take this is false nettle. Now I know. I, I call it ground oh, ivy, I thought, but yeah, I think it's got, Charlie. I think it's called false nettle as well. So you many know? names for them. What, what is it called? Swedish ivy. Okay. It's an ivy. It's a type of ivy. All right, so why would I throw this away? In other words, the ground has produced this, and I've got a squash plant right there, so I'm going to take this and just make a nest around there, and that'll add to the soil again. I'll get nutrition out of that. Why not? But that edging of your beds is really important. And if you forget, and, and uh, next the next season you'll wish you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other weeds that we should discuss. Um, this is thistle. This is baby thistle right here. This is more of an adult. This comes up. Here's a big one. There's a big version, milk thistle right there, which is actually a very valuable herb. The, it acts like a sedative. Uh, it's a nervine, actually. It makes you, uh, it helps you rest at night. It's also very good for the liver, like that. Getting rid of it, it takes a while. And you'll need to get rid of it, believe me, because it, it, it does send multiple root systems up all around the mother plant. So the best way to get rid of thistle is to just keep knocking it down. Every time it shows its head, knock it down. I talked with an Amish farmer once, and they're, they're dealing with fields of thistle problems. And what they do is they let it get about this high. It's, it almost begins to flower. They wait for the full moon. It's peaking because the moon regulates water movement on the oceans and your body and in these thistle plants as well in the earth. They wait for a full moon and they cut it down. It's kind of peaking right then. And if they do that, they tell me for two full moons, they get rid of it, they eradicate it. On our scale, we're talking about backyard gardening here, just keep knocking it out. And eventually the energy that's in the crown of the plant and the root system will dissipate. It'll, you'll, it'll so to speak, give up the ghost, right? And the, the other thing about thistle, or in this case, uh, can we move down here just a little bit? Okay, what's this? What plant is this? Dandelion. Whether it's thistle or whether it's dandelion, it's telling you something about your soil. What dandelion tells you 
by, by God's grace, it's a remedy for something wrong with your soil. Dandelion tells you your ground is either compacted or it's lacking in calcium. If you don't have calcium in your soil, the, the, for example, in tomatoes where there's a calcium deficiency, you get blossom end rot. The tomato forms and it's kind of looking okay. It starts to ripen a little bit and the end starts to rot. Have you had this happen before? That's a lack of calcium. In other words, it doesn't form the structure, the cellular structure you need due to lack of calcium to finish off. So by nature's arrangement, this dandelion is telling us there's a calcium deficiency here, and therefore it's a calcium pump. It's bringing up calcium, forming leaves, forming a dandelion head, and then depositing it. And of course, the root is very valuable as a medicine. It's full of calcium, and it's got other, many other, other wonderful things in it. So weeds generally mean, what's your definition? How did you say? Oh, weeds are a little misunderstood. That's yeah, weeds are really misunderstood. It's just something you don't know anything about. Yeah. But they're nature's remedy very often. So when, when you see a predominance of, say, dandelion or thistle, it's, it's a, there's a pH problem. There's a mineral deficiency problem, and therefore you have to learn the timing of these weeds and how do you, how, what's their value. And of course you have to take them out because they're crowding your vegetable production. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what else is in here? Some... I guess that's about it, huh? The weeds? Yeah, are... yeah there's... they keep them Any pretty questions? under control. Anybody have questions? Does the dandelion or a thistle uh, absorb a lot more nutrients? that you might be putting back into your garden? Like it, it, does be, it does absorb more nutrients because it's, it's got a deep root system. So if you can, if you can like I personally, I, I dig these up, I wash them off while they're soft, I, I slice them up, chicory is the same, and um, then I dehydrate them and I use them throughout the winter especially. Yeah, well, not the roots. I make tea with those, but the leaves are very good. They're, they're hybridized forms of dandelion. It's, they call it Italian dandelion. They have leaves this big. They had some at uh, the market. They had oh, do you? Yeah. yeah, I think next seven. Huh? Yeah, those are really amazing. They're real. They're they're bitter, but you probably you need bitter yeah. to stimulate your digestive system and whatnot, your liver. Yeah, but they're not putting nutrients back in. They're taking them right out of there. Well, they do if you compost them or if well, you if you yeah. if you mulch with them or like that. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. That's why farmers are the the best economists because they don't waste anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some sorrel over there. That's a fun one. The yellow flower. Oh, wood sorrel, right wood there. Wood sorrel. Remember this when you were a kid? Wood sorrel. You can. A yellow. Yeah, you yeah. can taste a little leaf if you it. Yeah. Brother used to tell me they're the edible flowers. Maybe it's a big brother thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all all of these plants have a gift to offer. Like this is this is all dried up now, but that's comfrey. It's a tip of a it's a growing tip of a comfrey plant. Comfrey has a root system that goes 12 feet deep. If you have a quarter acre of comfrey planted at one foot centers and 15 foot wide at one foot center, so say 10 plants across and 250 plants down, 250 feet down, the foliage from comfrey gives enough uh, mulch and nutrition to side dress three acres of row crop production. In other words, you're growing corn and you don't want to use chemical fertilizer and you don't want to use even or cow manure or whatever you have access to. You can do it all with comfrey incredibly valuable plant. The old common name for comfrey is knit bone, which means it heals any, it makes collagen, which heals bones and bruises and all kinds of incredible plants. And if you've ever had comfrey in your yard, you may know that it goes like crazy. Like once, once it's established, it'll really try to take over. So if that's something you're interested in, um, get some comfrey. I once planted a burlap bag of it, 10,000 rootlets, in a, in a big field because someone heard that it's good for cows, uh, for fodder for cows. 
Comfrey comes up in good soil three times this high. So you just cut, it's called chop and drop. You just chop it, drop it, harvest it, and you can feed it to your cows. Well, that's not true because they won't eat only comfrey. <laughs> you gotta mix it with other things, but it's an extreme, extremely valuable plant. Awesome. Okay? Yep. All right. All right. It's about seven o'clock. We've got one more stop and then we'll head back up for some discussion. There's different types of dock. There's burdock, yellow dock. This is called curly dock. This is in the buckwheat family. The Native American people used to wait till this gets a little more mature. And they would, maybe as a kid you've done is you just pull off like that. And you end up with all these little seeds. Like, whoa. Well, they're like, it's in the buckwheat family. So the Native people used to um, roast those. And that drop makes the shaft fall off of it. And they would pound it into a flour and they make cakes with this. And the, the early European pioneers, when they would see dock, not so much curly dock, more like uh, yellow dock or, or burdock, um, those leaves in the springtime were a welcome sight because after a whole winter of bear jerky and mush, you know, <laughs> corn mush, having something green to eat was really valuable. So another very valuable plant. Well, this is, um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about mulch. We talked about it um, for a little bit at the end of the last workshop, but uh, since it's so important and we're here, we just wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about it. Um, like we said before, it's pretty important to have some kind of mulch on your space. You really don't want to be, uh, working with bare soil uh, you want to keep your soil covered because for a lot of reasons it keeps the moisture in, keeps the temperature down it can help suppress the weeds um, and if you're using organic mulch it can help add organic matter to the soil um, so we just wanted to show a couple of examples here we've got a couple of different types of mulch um, on these beds um, as Donnie pointed out earlier in this bed, uh, we've got hay mulch. And you can kind of see like the, um, the thickness of this layer. That's a pretty solid, that's at least an inch, probably a little bit more than an inch uh, of mulch there, tucked right around these beets. Um, and that's where you want it, is really just right around, you can, Add the mulch kind of as soon as you plant. Um, again, keeping the bare soil covered, but there are some considerations with hay in particular and uh, organic mulches in that uh, it can contain or attract slugs. Uh, and the last thing you want it, when you mulch your new little baby plants is for them to get eaten by slugs, which has happened to us a little bit already this year. So if you look, you can look behind you, this row is new pepper plants, and they have uh, pulled the mulch away from them a little bit, and that helps keep the slugs from jumping up on those plants. Hopefully they look pretty safe. Have you guys had trouble with slugs before? Here's the symptom. Everything's looking great. And you come out the next morning and it's it's there's a stem only <laughs> you're like and there's no animal droppings and there's no tracks and you're like is this like an alien abduction or what what happened to the plants right what happens is the slugs are living under the hay sometimes some years if you have an extremely wet spring and you you are mulch enthusiasts and you just mulch time. right around your plants right away, you're going to have slugs most likely or if you have a lot of old boards laying around things like that so, slug damage. so the best thing to do is let the weather oh. let the weather change into what it's going to change into which is hopefully drier warmer weather and then it's not such an issue another thing that works with them is because they were alcoholics in their previous life is little saucers of beer at the right level you got to make sure it's at the right level so they crawl in and they uh, they can't withstand the smell of beer huh. 
and that's the end of the slugs. Yeah, so they drown essentially. In the beer. They yeah, they drowned in there. Um, yeah. Wait, can I talk about hay a little bit? Yeah. Okay, well, this is really important about hay. Again, not straw. Straw is just the shaft of wheat, barley, oats, whatever. Not the head. So it's very important, critical to know where your hay comes from, ideally. If you just go anywhere and you buy, or there's a farmer who's got a bunch of junk bales that got wet, they rotted, can't feed them to the cows. You've got to ask him, did you put, when you were growing this hay in that hay field, did you put any kind of chemical uh, pest herbicides on it? If they did, if you can get the name of it, that's critically important because I've seen people who do a great garden and it's nicely mulched and everything's fine and when the plants come up, they're, they're twisted looking, yellow and twisted, deformed. That's because of the toxicity of the herbicide that's in the hay now. Even, even uh, horse manure, cow, horses that eat that kind of hay and then eject horse manure, uh, that manure is contaminated. So you gotta know your sources. You gotta, sometimes they don't wanna tell you because they're embarrassed to tell you. But that's, it's really important. Also, the thickness of this hay, think eight inches. In the beginning, of course, you can't put eight inches on here because you're gonna block the sun. But don't think you're gonna mulch once and just walk away like, oh, I mulch, you know, no. Because any little bit of light that can get through will, and you'll have, now you got a problem. Now you can't even get to the weeds because you're being protected by the mulch. So in a bed like this, you've got to think, okay, I got my preliminary mulch down, and probably within about three weeks, I need to do it again. As the plants gain in height, you want to do it again. Until finally you get to a point, sometime in August usually, where the the weed thing starts to quiet down, starts to subside, because they know too that, well, here we go again, winter is coming. <laughs> so that's that's important. Yeah. Um, and if anybody, I don't know if anybody has tried to source mulch at all, um, or if you're interested in that, the best way is to know a farmer, I would say. Um, but um, other than that, I've had luck finding hay, you know, through various internet platforms, Craigslist, Facebook. Um, I don't know if you have any recommendations for sourcing hay mulch. No, you just got to kind of look around. The, the other thing is forget hay, use leaves. Use leaves, if you have access to leaves. There is, I mean, look around us, look behind you. See that, that whole world of trees? That is the best fertilizer, better than cow manure, better than horse manure, better than any manure in the world. Because a tree has a root system that goes as broad as the crown of the tree, or the canopy of the tree, and deep into the soil. And it's pulling up micronutrients and all kinds of things, giving it to us freely. So it's a free source of, of nutrition. And once it's broken down, uh, after a year or so, unless you take your lawnmower and run over it and break it, the more you can do that and bust it into little chips, it's easy to mulch with. So you can have an entire mulch garden just based upon your neighbor's leaves or your leaves, like that. You don't have to worry about, oh, I hope I could find a farmer that's got uncontaminated hay. That's true, and you can collect up leaves in the fall and store them, obviously. Right. Like, you can just make a big pile that you keep adding to year after year. and. Um, that's even better, I would say. Just we have a, a new garden project called the Show and Tell Garden, just below the office of Grow How Valley on, what's that hill called? Vineyard Hill. Vineyard Hill, the highest, I think it's the highest point in Wheeling. And in that garden, we're not only showing vegetable production, but we're showing, intera or we're interacting with learning stations in the garden, one of which is leaf composting various ways to leave compost, passively or more aggressively or like that, we're showing that. So we're inviting you, uh, when's that gonna happen? Hopefully the next workshop we can do there. Right, next workshop. Um, I think next workshop. Come out and see that. Right now we're kind of waiting for our plants to grow up so it's not yeah. just... It's not super exciting right now. A lot of talk and no plants. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Can you use dried grass as a mulch? Yes. Absolutely. It's essentially like the hay mulch. 
Yeah. yeah. So, definitely. Yeah, your, your mowed grass is great. Just rake it up. And just dry it out and let it go. Yeah, if you do a, do a cut and then just let it sit on for a minute. Sure. That's I lived in India for many years, and in the village level in India, this of course is changing now because of Western influence, but they use scythes just like in Europe. And when a farmer has to feed his cows, uh, they just go out and cut it fresh. And they, and they bring, you know, bundle it, they bring it in and feed it to the cows. So the same principles there for mulch, if you want to do that. I mean, all these banks and hills, how do you think, how do you think the, our ancestors did this? They didn't have weed whackers. <laughs> they did it using a scythe. And once you know how to sharpen one, razor sharp, and keep it sharp while you're in the field. They're a very, very effective tool. In fact, out at the Big Wheeling Agrarian Center, if you ever like to come out there, I can do a demonstration for you how, how we do that. We have a comment from Melissa on to kind of say she, I think, collected leaves to mulch with, but they didn't break down very much. So she heard you can sprinkle nitrogen on top. Yeah, you can use comfrey. You can also use nettles. Uh, there's there are certain ends. Uh, there are certain accelerants that are catalysts to help those break down. The other thing is just be is if you ideally can mow it with your lawnmower and break it into small pieces, it'll break down very quickly. Whatever you do, whether it's hay or you see how you're standing on wood chips here, don't put them in the soil. Let them just sit on the soil because if you do that, you have frustrated the real farmers. Who are the real farmers? The microorganisms that are in the soil. We're not, all we're doing is trying to cooperate with them. So if you take wood chips and you think, oh, you know, this is organic, you know, they just throw it in the soil and work it in. Bad idea, really bad idea, because you slow down their activity to a crawl. And likewise with leaves, if, it's, if they're whole leaves, do not, you can mulch with them, they're fine, they will break down, but don't incorporate them. Can you add worms to your compost pile to make it go faster? Yeah, we're in the process of doing that. We, we have worm towers that we're building now <laughs> that are real that simple. It's just like a tube, <coughs> excuse me, a PVC tube, four inch, and with a cap on it, holes drilled in it, and you put your, your uh, food scraps in there and your worms. Where are you doing that? <laughs> I'm doing that at the Big Wheeling, uh, or I'm sorry, at the Show and Tell Garden. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. That's going to be one of the, the new, That's that fun. was a surprise, you're not supposed to know. Oh, that. yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't know about that. That's fun. Yeah, I've composted with worms a good bit, too, uh, and they, they eat fast. The red worms uh, tend to eat really fast if you feed them with scraps. Um, we get them from... Uh, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm, shout out, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm <laughs> online, so you can get red wigglers. Where's that? I think it's in Ohio. I'm not huh. sure. I'd have to double check. Can you pan around to these houses here? I want to talk about diet. Here's, here's the crazy thing. We're out here talking about these little gardens, and you know, you've, each one of you has a backyard garden, which is noble, fantastic and you're gonna get better and better at it. Look at this housing here. This is working class housing. Everybody in this neighborhood has to eat two or three times a day. I guarantee you almost all of their food comes from California, which is running out of water. And it's all, it's all chemically fertilized, it's all heavily sprayed with herbicides and pesticides. Yet, here we are right here, 200 feet away, and we're, so we're, the mission of Girl Howe Valley in, in our education department is to make those relationships meaningful so that we are relevant to all the people that are our friends, our neighbors, and our, that have to eat just like we do. So your garden can be uh, a, a um, magnet for attracting that as well, as the more beautiful you make it, the more productive you make it, the more attractive it is to your neighbors, and it's a great, it's the new currency. It's, it's a, a gifting economy. When you take produce that you've grown and give it to a neighbor, you've created a, a lifelong friendship. So that's really the heartbeat of Grow How Valley and the education department. True. 
All right, we're about uh, 10 minutes out from 7.30, which is our scheduled end time. Uh, I'm a little afraid to go back up under the highway with the grass being mowed. I don't think we'd be able to hear each other, but does anybody have any, um, any questions about anything we talked about here or any questions about your own space? that you want to throw out are there? Are there any differences in, because we have a raised garden bed, so what you talked about today, would you change anything for a raised garden bed or basically the same? Same. Okay. More water. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> Dry, what I thought. More water. Dries out quicker. We have really great draining soil because I'm always like poking my finger in to check. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it drains quite a bit. So I um, water it in the morning, soak it really well. And then in the evening, I give it a, not as much of a soak. What, what do you do when the garden's done in the fall? This is our first year having it, so. Yeah, we're not sure. Okay, so, all right. Yeah. All right, so we have a workshop on that. Okay. Good. Coming up. Yeah. Coming up. Yeah. It's, yeah. Called, it's called the early, early, really early garden. Okay. And it's about how to get things, even if it's wet and cold, how to get things growing early. Yeah. So you don't run into that cycle of delayed garden, it uh, goes from sp uh, two weeks of spring to hot weather, and everything bolts. Everything goes to seed. Mm -hmm. How to how to overcome that? Another workshop. Cool. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anybody on Computer World have any questions? You have to think of this traffic as as if we're on the, the, the beach, and yeah, those so those are the gentle waves <laughs> coming. <Right. in. laughs> At what point do you guys start using uh, row covers for some of your brassicas? Do you start that now? Yeah, the best thing with brassicas, you don't have to row cover. What you need to get is a product called BT, the Phyllis Thurogenis. And it's a, uh, if you have a small garden especially, it's so simple, you get a one gallon pump sprayer, you put it, it holds one gallon, you put one teaspoon of BT in it, and preventatively, you spray the, your brassicas, cabbage, collards, kale, all that stuff, preventatively. Once you see those little fluttering white butterflies, that's the enemy because they lay eggs on the undersides which turn into what are called cabbage loopers. And they skeletalize your whole plant. Mm. So if you do that every 10 days, you'll, I, I'm growing like, a, oh God, man, it's like a thousand plants in black woven ground cover. Like this, except black, or it's like, like over That's here. Awesome. And uh, it's a huge problem. If I don't do that, and a one gallon sprayer, it's amazing for a small garden. You, 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 when you're done with that spraying, you've got to pour it out because it's not effective if you leave it sit in there. It's so maybe a, only half a gallon is all you need. It's a pathogen, it's a bacteria, bacterial pathogen of that insect. So you, uh, it will like infect the cabbage looper and kill it. Likewise, your so tomatoes. It that's why it won't last over the winter. Your tomatoes, you need to spray preventatively and then every 10 days with copper uh, sulfate, copper sulfate. It's organic, just like BT is completely organic. I wouldn't eat it, but it's, it's completely harmless. So copper sulfate. Again, we're going to have a, another workshop. Yeah. We're going to talk about Specific individual, but you need to know this stuff now because if you've got brassicus cabbage family in the ground, you need to deal with it now. Because mm -hmm. once they get a hold, yeah, and that will be the next thing we have to distribute, will be a couple of those um, pesticides. And copper sulfide is a fungicide, so it's attacking the fungus that attacks the tomatoes. Right. Um, and if you don't spray it, what happens is you start seeing um, blight, early blight. All of a sudden, like, why is this happening? It gets yellow on the bottom and it moves up, and then you got a few tomatoes hanging, <laughs> no forage. Yeah. And that's another thing about tomatoes. You want to, if at all possible, prevent any of the leaves from touching the ground. So if you I saw your post on yeah. Facebook and I went out and I was like, oh, I yeah. So if you have like leaves hanging down, touching the soil, it's okay to just pick them off, I'd rather not have them in contact. Um, Don, did that answer your question or? Okay. Yeah. 
it, it comes in a powdered form. It also goes by the trade name at Lowe's is Thuricide. Thuricide, it's the same stuff. DT, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's called something like that. Yeah, Bacillus thuringiensis, I yeah. think is what it is. Some big Latin name. With a B. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? You guys using drip irrigation? Yeah, uh, pretty soon she'll probably have it out. I think it's just a little too early. But we have, I can go, there's some up there. I can go grab some, or we can stop up there on the way. We just use um, the pretty standard stuff. It's like, um, drip probably drip, yeah, drip tape, like half inch black drip tape. Um, and uh, recently, it's been really nice to have that. Recently we started uh, putting that stuff on a timer that just um, waters at the correct time. Um, yeah, imagine trying to water this whole thing by hand, dragging a hose around yeah. on an angle. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's nuts, it's not possible. <laughs> It can't be done, but you got to have a lot of help. I used to do it in Mississippi. I had six acres in production, and I had a lot of volunteers. And we used to do it in phases. I mean, literally, today's your day. <laughs> it's been six hours out here. <laughs> when the sun goes down. After 10 o'clock in Mississippi, you're done. 10 a.m., you're yeah. done. It's so hot. And then you can't come back till about 5, 6. So the watering was all done at that time in uh, stages like that. Yeah. We also actually use a sprinkler system out here, mm. um, which is kind of new. So uh, maybe we can report back on how the sprinkler system is going this year, if they bring it back or not. But I, I anticipate the drip tape will come out very soon. Questions? Anybody else? I have one thing to show you. This is from the Native American tradition. This will work here. This is called a... Well, that's concrete, but here's a natural one. This is a Native American weather rock. Are you familiar with this? No? Okay, come on, gather around over here. <laughs> And put it in a little bit like that. Now, the way you tell weather with this is if you see it shaking, it means it's windy. <laughs> if you can't see it at all, it's foggy. <laughs> and if it's white, it's snowing. And if it changes color, it gets more brown, it's raining. <laughs> Pretty simple technology, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Common sense. <laughs> Papa will be selling weather rocks yeah, out, was, of the, out of the sale. trunk of his oh, yeah, <laughs> trunk Thanks, after the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. Uh, appreciate you all coming out. And thank you all for tuning in. And thank everyone who's going to be watching later. Uh, this, has been, this has been good. Um, if you end up having any other questions about any of this, definitely let us know. Um, if you want to come visit the farm at any point, let us know. We'll definitely try to schedule um, a visit. But uh, in, if in the meantime you're just curious, get a hold of us. We'll hook you up with Tapa. Um, the next things we have going on are actually, you guys uh, have stuff in the ground now. Uh, so the next thing we have going on are harvest logs. Uh, which we've alluded to, but uh, now it's actually going to be coming up. On the last day of the month, we'll be asking for your harvest total. So if you have harvested anything from your garden yet, um, there is a, a paper sheet in your binder that you can use to keep track of all that stuff as you do it. But uh, there's a pretty simple online form that you can use to just pop those totals in. Um, and we'll send plenty of reminders um when it comes time for that but we will be uh 
pretty persistent for the harvest mm -hmm. lots <laughs> because uh, Grow Appalachia really likes us to have those. Um, so that'll be the next thing I think. And then uh, we will have some of those pesticides and fungicides available in the coming weeks um, for anybody that needs them. Um, and then our next workshop uh, will be in a month, hoping to have that at the meadow farm where the uh, show and tell garden is, but we'll send more details about that coming up. Am I forgetting anything? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. For your much. kind attention. Right. <laughs> Drive safely. <laughs>